Hey, Woodlands Church, I am so glad that you've joined us for our Holy Week communion service on this Wednesday night. And um, it's so exciting that we can do this church online and we can stream our services live. And God's been working miraculously. I think we had over 50,000 people view our weekend services and we're getting ready for Easter. And it's the greatest celebration uh, and it's the most amazing day of the year, and our Easter starts on Good Friday with all of our Easter services. So I'm so glad you're joining us. We're gonna take communion together. I'm gonna be teaching a message on how you can be unshakable during these times where everything seems to be shaking. And we're gonna have some great music, so I hope you'll let friends know and tune in, and, and we're gonna answer some questions at the end of the service. Uh, now, what I want to tell you is I want you to get communion ready um, because you're going to take communion in your home. You know, we've just designated all of our homes at Woodland Church a house of prayer. So now you're a church house. I, I just say you're a church house now. And so we're all meeting in our homes and you know, all over the city, all over the world at Woodland Church. But we're going to take communion together in just a moment. I want to show you how to get it ready. And so what I did is I just used some things that I had at my house. Um, in case you couldn't go out and get something. So it's not so important exactly what the items are. It's what they symbolize that's most important. So what I have up here are some table water crackers that I've just broken up a little bit. Uh, and then I have some juice in a cup. Um, I didn't have any grape juice available uh, without going to the store. And um, it's really not that important. Of course, Jesus used wine. And the reason why we don't use wine here at Woodlands Church for communion is because of so many who are in our restoration ministry who are overcoming alcoholism. But, um, and so we want to be sensitive to that and also the children that know the Lord that will be taking communion. But I encourage you, use whatever you want to use, but get it ready uh, when we share this next song. And we're going to be singing together, but, but I, I want you to have it ready because later in the message, we're gonna take communion together. And it's gonna be such a powerful thing. There's something really healing about communion. There's something about the Lord's Supper that is so powerful. Jesus never asked us to remember his birth. He, he never asked us to celebrate Christmas, though there's nothing wrong with it, and we love to celebrate Christmas at Woodlands Church. But he did ask us to remember his death, his death on the cross and how important that is to save us from our sins and his resurrection that gives us new life. And so we're gonna do that by taking communion. So I hope you got something around the house, some crackers, some bread, something, some juice, um, whatever it may be that you can use to take communion. And I believe God is gonna bring healing and strength. God's gonna work miracles in our midst in your church home over the next hour. You know, Easter is coming up. It starts Friday here at Woodland Church, and our program this year, our presentation is called For God So Loved the World. And it's based on John 3, 16, a verse everyone knows, but do you really grasp it? And we have so many creative things planned. The Watoto Children's Choir from Uganda, um, they're gonna be helping us out uh, on video back and forth, doing some really cool things, some really creative things. And we have people from all over the world that are gonna be participating in this service, not just tuning in, but actually participating in it, helping us out in the service. And Chris and I are gonna be speaking. I mean, it's gonna be so creative. For God so loved the world. And we want you to start a little hashtag. Uh, hashtag FGSL, FGSL, for God so loved. And then maybe put a, a picture of your town where you live. We're getting uh, videos from all over the world right now from people who tune in on our church online all over the world, and it's so cool to see that. And we're gonna be uh, doing some amazing things Easter, but I wanna give you the service time so that you can put them down and you can invite friends for this presentation of For God So Loved the World. Okay, it starts on Good Friday at 6 p.m. That'll be our first service, and they'll be live 6 and 7.30. So there's two on Good Friday. It's all the same service, 6 and 7.30 p.m. on Good Friday. And then Saturday at 6 and 7.30 p.m. And then on Sunday, we start with a sunrise service. Again, these are all live. 
And we're going to be actually not just on Church Online and all of our streaming outlets, but Channel 11, K-H-O-U, the CBS local station here, Channel 11, is going to carry our sunrise service live, you know, all over the city of Houston and the Gulf Coast area that they cover. So you can tune in also on Channel 11 at 7 a.m. And then Sunday at 9.30 and 11.30 a.m. And then 1, 3, 5, and 7 p.m. It's going to be powerful. You know, I, I remember when all this first started and um, when we couldn't have church as far as meeting in a building, but we could still meet. And that's what we're doing. But the church is in a building. It's the body of Christ. And the church is all about Christ's body. And so we're still meeting in your local house of prayer. Um, but I'll never forget when this first happened, I was looking at the calendar and I said to my wife, I said, Chris, eat, we may have to cancel Easter. And she just laughed at me. I said, Carrie, if we're not canceling Easter, you don't cancel Easter. Easter can't be canceled because Jesus rose from the dead. And that's what it's all about. It's not about meeting in a church building. And I laughed with her and I said, you're right. You know, and what's been amazing is we believe that more people are gonna tune in more people are really going to come to our Easter services than ever in the history of Woodlands Church. And we believe more people are going to come to Christ this Easter through Woodlands Church than any other Easter in our 26 Easters. We really believe that. That's what God has been doing and preparing us for. Think about this for a moment. I believe with all my heart that this Easter more people are going to come to Christ on this Easter 2020 than at any other time in human history. That's what we're praying for as a staff team. That's what we're praying for with churches all around the world because I really believe that, that this crisis has opened up such a hunger for God, such a hunger for God's word and such a hunger to know what really matters in Jesus Christ. People are looking for spiritual answers. Now, we always read about the statistics from COVID-19. And one of the stats that they say each and every day is there were this many deaths from COVID-19 over the last 24 hours. And, and, you know, we look at the stats to see if they're going up or if they're leveling off. And we look at the infection rates and all that. And, and that's important to do. But that stat that bothers us so much is that over the last 24 hours, there were so many deaths from COVID-19. But do you know what I believe with all my heart? I believe that after Easter Sunday coming up, that we'll be able to say, we'll be able to say the number in the thousands of people through Woodland Church who were reborn in those 24 hours, who were reborn through all of our Easter services, who were reborn in 2020. And so I just really encourage you, I believe, I really do believe that there's going to be more people who come to faith in Christ this Easter 2020 because God is working even in the middle of all of the crisis of COVID-19. I believe there's going to be more people come to Jesus Christ this Easter than any other day in all of human history. And it's the most exciting time to ever be alive. You know, I want us to sing to the Lord right now. And if you haven't got your communion items ready, then you can do that as a family as well. But let's just sing. You love me as you find me. Because I want us to prepare hearts to know that the reason we celebrate the reason why we lift our Lord up because he came while we were yet sinners and he loved us just the way we were and he saved us. But then he loves us too much to let us stay that way. He wants us to grow and, and to trust him and to follow him with all our hearts. So let's just sing it to him right now. Our team is all over the place and, and they put all this together. So let's just sing to the Lord.
I've been faithful and I've been reckless at every bend. I've held everything together and watched it shatter. I've stood tall and I have crumbled in the same breath. I have wrestled and I have trembled towards surrender. Just my heart adrift and drifted home again. Plundered blessing till I've been desperate to find redemption. Every time I turn around, oh, you're still there. And I was found before I was lost. I was yours before I was mine. You wear the scars for all my mistakes. Thank you. 
This kind of love is real oh, It's a grace I can never end To be somebody you still want Somehow You love me as you find me Oh yeah You love me as you find me The word that we've all heard over and over again the last few weeks is the word crisis. We all know we're in an unprecedented crisis. It's a health crisis because of the coronavirus. Um, we have never seen anything like this in our lifetime. And so it's threatening everyone's health. And then it's a mental health crisis. You know, we hear that depression, anxiety is just way up in the lives of so many around our nation, so many around the world, because of being isolated and all the fears and the worries that come in each and every day with all the bad news, it, it just sometimes feels overwhelming. And so it's a mental health crisis. And then it's an economic crisis, as no one knows for sure what all the shutdown is going to do to the economy. And, and there have been layoffs and so many are going through financial pain and everyone is wondering what happens next. And so the word crisis is something that feels so very real to us. But I want you to see that God is still king in the crisis. The crisis time is Christ time. It's amazing how the Bible written thousands of years ago speaks directly to us in our current situation. One of the questions I'm getting asked a lot is, Pastor Kerry, what in the world is going on? We've never seen anything like this. So what in the world is happening? What is God up to? What is happening here? Well, I want to share with you tonight what is happening. And we go to God's word, not the latest headlines, but to God's word. In an obscure little book in the Old Testament, um, inspired by God and written by the prophet Haggai in chapter 2, beginning with verse 6, it says, This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. I want you to underline the phrase, shake all nations. That what is happening right now is, we're in this place of shaking, and all nations are going through it. Every nation in the world is going through it, this shaking that is taking place. Now, is God punishing the world? Is God punishing people? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say that. I don't think God is punishing because God is a God of love, and God is a good God. And so whatever God is doing in this situation, he always does it out of love. But here, here's the thing. God 
sometimes allows bad things into our lives, but it's always for a greater purpose. And sometimes we can't understand it when we're going through things like this. We won't understand everything about it until we get to heaven. But, but I can tell you one thing that I know God is doing is God is allowing a shaking to take place. God is allowing all of us to be shaken to show us what is unshakable. And because unless a shaking takes place, you never know what's unshakable in your life. But that's exactly what God is doing right now. God, I'm not saying God caused this. I'm saying that God has allowed this. And it's a shaking of all nations. And it's a shaking that wakes us up to the things that can't be shaken. Those things that are unshakable. So I've got good news for you tonight. In fact, I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Psalms if you've got a Bible around. If not, the verse will be up on your screen because this is our key passage. You don't have to stand um, if you're a, sitting on the sofa. You don't have to stand. Um, but if you want to stand in honor of God's word, Psalm 62, verse 5 and 6 tells us that no matter how everything around us is shaking, no matter how much everything around you is being shaken and crumbling, you can remain unshaken. So how can we be unshakable? Well, let's read this. Maybe you want to just read it out loud on your screen. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. Let's pray together. Dear God, I thank you so much for this message that you put on my heart. And I see so clearly that your word tells us exactly what is going on today and that all these things that we trust in, that we think are for sure, are really fragile. And you've shown us, Lord, that just a microscopic virus can bring the whole world to a halt. It just shows us, Lord, how fragile we are and everything around us is. But Lord, I know there's some things that are totally unshakable. And you want us to be a people who are unshakable when the whole world is shaking. So I pray that you just show us how we can be that, Lord. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want you to underline that phrase, I will not be shaken. Now, he doesn't say here that you'll never go through times of shaking. You will never go through difficulties, that you'll never go through a crisis, that, you know, some pastors preach that if you love God, then you'll never have any problems. You'll never have a crisis in your life. You'll never go through any pain or tragedy or loss. And that's just not true. He, he doesn't say here that you will never go through times of when everything else around you is shaking, uh, when everything seems totally uncertain. But he does say, no matter what's going on in your circumstances around you, you will not be shaken. You will not be shaken. But there is a premise with this promise, and it's a really important one. And there's a premise with this promise. He said, there's something you have to do so that you'll be unshakable when everything around you is shaking. What is it? Underline two words there in that passage, God alone. And I know you can't underline it because you probably haven't printed it out, but you can print it out your notes if you want to, but I just want you to focus in on it. God alone. You see, the premise with the promise is that I have to place my faith in God alone. I have to trust in God alone. Because if I don't trust in God alone, then I will be shaken. That those things that I'm trusting in will be shaken. And so he's the only solid rock, the one that we can place our faith in. And if we find rest in God alone, if we hope in God alone, and we realize that he alone is my rock, he alone is my salvation, he alone is my fortress, he won't be shaken. And if I'm in Christ, I can't be shaken. You see, it's the crisis that turns us to the solid rock. Abraham Lincoln said, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. I think one of the things that God is doing right now is he's allowing this shaking to take place because he wants us to see that he's the only solid rock that we can turn to and so many are turning to him right now. When they see the things they've been trusting in are faulty, the things they've been trusting in are fragile, 
then they look for what they can trust in. And he's the only one. Well, Paul experienced a similar situation in the New Testament when he was arrested, became a prisoner and put on a ship going to Rome for trial. And there on that ship, they ran into a terrible storm. And in the middle of that storm, it was a, it was a storm, it was a crisis. But I want you to see how Paul was unshakable through it all and how it changed everyone on that boat. And so I want us to see several things that we can learn about the crisis through the crisis that Paul went through. First, the crisis can clarify my priorities. The crisis clarifies our priorities. Just a few days before the men had aboard that ship, had gotten aboard that ship that Paul was on, just a few days before it, they were loading cargo onto the ship. And I'm sure they were being so careful because it was such valuable cargo that they valued so greatly. And so I'm sure they were putting it in the boat very carefully to make sure none of it was lost, none of it was broken, because it was valuables that they were shipping to Rome. And it says, though, after the storm hit, In verse 18, it says, we took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw cargo overboard. So when the storm hit and the boat was shaken, they began to throw the valuable cargo overboard. I mean, they wanted to keep the boat from sinking. They saw that if we don't throw the cargo overboard, we're gonna sink, we're gonna die, we're gonna lose our lives. And so just a few days before, that cargo had seemed so valuable, but now it seemed worthless to them compared to losing their life. And so they realized that all that they'd been trusting in was worthless. It's in the crisis that you really see what matters. It's in the crisis that you can really see what's valuable because just a month ago, all the things that we thought were so important don't seem so important anymore. And that's what happens in the crisis. The crisis can clarify our priorities. See, God allows a shaking in our lives, not to shake our faith, but to shake our faith in the things that don't really matter. To shake our faith in the things that we're trusting in that aren't eternal because we put our trust in so many things that we think are gonna be here forever. We put our trust in our bank account, our stock portfolio. We put our trust in you know, other people. We put our trust in material things. And God says, be careful what you're trusting in because if you're trusting in anything that could change or be taken away, then you're on shaky ground. You're not unshakable. But if you put your trust in me, the solid rock, you'll have clear priorities. You'll see what's really important. And here's the great news is during this coronavirus crisis in the middle of all the bad and all the painful, it really clarifies our priorities so that we can see what's really important, what's going to last. And what's going to last is not material things. It's the things you can't see, faith, hope, love, the souls of men and women, relationships, our relationship to God and our relationships to the people around us, that's what's going to last. And all those things that we think are so important lose their value in the crisis. And so I really challenge you to evaluate your priorities during this time. What are you trusting in that can be shaken? You see, God is still in control and it's all moving toward his crescendo of Christ's return. And so it may look like everything's in chaos, that everything is out of control, but God's still in control. And we're moving toward the crescendo of history and the history is his story. In Hebrews 12, 26, it says, when God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth, but now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. I want you to underline that phrase, only unshakable things will remain. You see, this is what's going to happen to the earth at the end of time. You know, when it's all said and done, and I don't know when that'll be, no one does. Scripture tells us that that only the Father, and he's going to tell the Son when to return, but But when it's all said and done, every material thing on this earth is just gonna go up in smoke. It doesn't really matter. That's not what matters. Those things are temporary. You can't take them with you when you die. They're temporary. It's the things that you can't see. Those eternal things 
that are going to last forever. But it says here that only unshakable things will remain. And so he's saying here on this earth, don't put your faith, don't put your trust in those things that are shakable, that are temporary. Put your faith in what is permanent, what is going to last. Sometimes God shakes me in order to wake me. Do you realize that? Sometimes God shakes you in order to wake you because sometimes we're just going through life really sleepwalking because we, we, we think we're gonna be here forever. We think that we'll never die. We think that we're unshakable and that all the things that we have are just gonna keep growing and that everything is gonna be great and that all these material things are gonna be here for us. But it's just not that way. See, sometimes God allows us shaking in order to wake us up from our sleep so that we can stop wasting our life. And I just challenge you, if this crisis has really shaken you to the core, turn to the rock, Jesus Christ, and let him clarify your priorities and start focusing in on the things that are gonna matter, focusing in on loving God and loving others because that's all that matters when it's all said and done. And maybe this crisis, this time where God has shaken you will wake you so that you'll stop wasting your one and only life. You know, I think this is gonna shake a lot of young people who are heading off to college thinking about how they're gonna make money and how they're gonna be successful. Don't think about how you're gonna be successful. Think about how you're gonna be significant, how you're gonna live a life that matters. Nothing wrong with being successful, it's just it'll never satisfy. But how are you gonna live a life that matters? And I watch these healthcare workers going into, these, going into the hospitals and, and they're going right into harm's way because they're caring about people. It's not because of their pay, it's because they care, because they love, because they're doing what really matters. And, and so many of you Woodlands Church, you're doing the things that really matter. And, and here's the thing, it, nothing wrong with making money, nothing wrong with being successful. It's just that don't settle for success. Change to significance. Make a difference in this life. Make a difference through your giving, through your serving, through your loving. That's all that's gonna matter when it's all said and done. And so I, I just challenge you, think about this crisis. And is God trying to shake you so he can wake you? Wake you up from living a wasted life because he loves us so very much. I want you to underline in that last verse the phrase, holy fear and awe. You see, we're to fear God. Now, this is really important during this time because we're all gonna be filled with fear at times, anxiety, uncertainty, but that's when we need to look to God and fear God. It just means hold him in holy awe, to put him first in our lives, to look to him first because if you don't fear God, you're gonna fear everything else. But when you fear God, then all your fears evaporate. You just come to him and go, God, I have these fears and anxieties, but I come to you and I pour them on you. And you pray about them, you talk to God about them. But I want you to see a second thing. The crisis not only clarifies my priorities, the crisis can strengthen my relationships. When the storm got even worse, some of the officers, uh, they tried to abandon ship and they tried to get in the lifeboats and save themselves. And they, they just wanted to bail out and save themselves. But Paul says this in verse 31. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it fall. You see in your relationships, the crisis will either draw you closer together or it will rip you apart. And it all depends upon one word, commitment. Whether you get ripped apart by the storm or you get brought closer together in your relationship in the storm, it all comes down to commitment your commitment. You see, Paul had been listening to God and God told him, hey, if any of these guys leave, they're gonna die. And so they, everybody has to stay with the ship. In fact, you know, everybody's gonna die if these guys leave. And so Paul says, unless you stay in the boat, unless we stay in this boat together, uh, then we're all going under. And so they were believing Paul by this time. And so they cut the ropes to the lifeboats and let them sail off so they wouldn't have an option. It was like, you know, hey, Paul, we believe you, but <clears throat> we're gonna get in this place where 
We're going to start to doubt, and those lifeboats are going to look really good when the waves get really high. So we're going to go ahead and cut them right now. We're going to cut the lifeboats right now so we have no choice. But we've got to stay together on the ship. That reminds me so much of marriage, the marriage commitment. It's like you've got to cut the lifeboat to divorce and say, you know what, we're stuck together. You know, Chris and I have been married for 34 years, and whenever we get into an argument, whenever we get into a rough patch, whenever we go through difficulties, whenever we and I can't get along. We always say, well, you're stuck with me. So we gotta figure this out. She says it, I say it. We're stuck with each other. So we gotta figure this out. We're both broken together. And so we're stuck with each other. And I love that because, and Chris started it. And <laughs> I love it because I'm so glad she's stuck with me. It's like, we gotta work this thing out because we cut the life wraps. We cut the ropes to the life wraps, life wraps, and, and we're not getting out. We're, we're staying. We're not going to bail. And so we said, that's not an option for us. So we cut the ropes to the lifeboats, and we're stuck in the boat together. So we got to figure this thing out. And I just want to encourage you during this time, it's so important to cut the ropes from some of the lifeboats that you've been going to, uh, to comfort you, to distract you, you know, and I know that alcoholism is way up right now. Uh, pornography use is way up right now. There's so many things that, are, uh, that, that um, people use to distract themselves, to, to look to when they're under stress, and those are so destructive. And so I just really challenge you to, to cut some of the ropes to those lifeboats, those things that you've been going to that other than God. And so you'll be forced to go to God. Maybe get one of those... Um, covenant eyes is what I use and all of our pastors use on the internet. And it's an accountability software. You ought to look it up. It's awesome. And, you know, it, you have an accountability partner that sends, if you go to a questionable website, um, uh, when you're tempted and you click across something, you want to stay there, then it will send a little note to your accountability partner and so they can talk with you about it. We, we have all our pastors on covenant eyes. And so that's really like cutting that option to look at pornography because we know how destructive it is in our own hearts and relationships and how prevalent it is in men and women today. And so right now, this is such an important time to put some filter on your computer, on your iPhone, on your iPad, on your laptop. It's so important. It's so important to cut those life rafts. And, and I don't know what it is that you look to, if it's eating, you know, I've been struggling with that a little bit, and whatever it is, maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's um, pornography, um, I don't know, maybe it's just getting distracted and just wanting to sleep, maybe it's just watching television all the time, maybe it's watching, you know, 20 movies on Netflix and binging, I don't know what it is, but I really challenge you, cut those ropes to the lifeboat so that you don't have that option, do whatever it takes so that you can tune in to Christ, the solid rock. And so I want us to see how the crisis can strengthen our relationships. But then I want you to see a third thing, the crisis can anchor my life. The crisis can really anchor your life. It's amazing because we think the crisis, you know, really just tears us apart from any anchoring, but the crisis can really anchor your life. It says in Acts 27, 29, Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and they prayed for daylight. It's the first time some of these guys had ever prayed. But they're praying now to Paul's God. And they're praying, God, help us. And this is the first time that millions of people have prayed during this crisis. There's so many who are now praying, so many now looking to God, so many saying, God, save me. I need you. So many are praying now that have never prayed before. What an opportunity. But it says they dropped four anchors. And I want to look at four anchors that can hold you strong when everything around you is shaking. First, the anchor of unshakable courage. God wants to give you the anchor of unshakable courage in the face of fear. In Acts 27, 24, Paul said, do not be afraid. Or God said this to Paul. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. So God comes to him in the middle of the storm when it looks like the boat is going under. And God says, Paul, my purpose for you hasn't changed. My purpose is unshakable. I have a purpose that no storm can shake, that no coronavirus can take out. I have a purpose for your life, and my purpose for your life will not be stopped by anything. 
And so just know you have an unshakable purpose. You're going to stand trial before Caesar. And so you're going to make it. I'm going to fulfill my purpose in your life. And then in verse 25, he says, so keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. So then Paul goes and tells, after God speaks to his heart, Paul goes and tells everyone else. He says, hey, have courage because I have a promise from God that, that the purpose for my life will not be stopped, that no storm can stop God's purpose for my life. And I have some words for you today, Woodlands Church. There is no virus that can stop God's purpose for your life. There is no shaking in the economy that can stop God's purpose for your life. God is going to fulfill his purpose for your life because you have an unshakable purpose if you're in Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget that. That unshakable purpose that comes from knowing the Lord. But then the second anchor of the four is the anchor of unshakable community. In Acts 27, 24, it says, God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. An angel appeared and said, hey, Paul, God is gonna give you all the lives of everyone sailing with you too. He's not gonna save you, but he's gonna save everyone with you. How powerful is that? I mean, you know, Paul was a godly man and those guys were safe because they were right next to the godly man. And how powerful is that? The safest place to be in a crisis is connected to godly people, connected to the body of Christ. And none of us have it together. We're all sinners saved by grace. But once you come to Jesus Christ, you're part of his family. You're a child of God, a child of the king. And what's amazing about that is you're in the king's family. And so the safest place to be in a crisis is surrounded by godly people. And that's why you need to keep connecting with each other. We connect, we connect in the church family just because we're not meeting in a physical location. We're still meeting. We're meeting constantly. And so keep connected in the body of Christ. And then there's the anchor of unshakable compassion. The anchor of unshakable compassion. The crisis reveals that anchor of unshakable compassion. It says in 1 John 3, 17, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. That's always been our motto and our verse here at Woodland Church, that we just don't wanna just say we love you, we wanna show you. We don't wanna just preach the gospel of hope, we wanna be in our community giving hope and showing Christ's love. And so that's what you've been doing, Woodlands Church. And, and let me give you an update this week of some of the things that you've done that just amaze me. Uh, we just fed 530 meals to HCA Conroe Hospital. We're really feeding a lot of the healthcare professionals. What we're finding is, is, is that it's really hard for them. You know, a lot of the cafeterias are shut down and everything's, you know, different. And so we bring in these meals in a safe way and, um, and we've connected with some of the, the food people in the area and uh, Papa John's and, and Firehouse Subs and uh, Chick-fil-A and we buy these meals as a church and we bring them in. And so uh, 530 meals to HCA Conroe Hospital, 652 meals went to Texas Children's, um, 250 meals went to MD Anderson in the Woodlands. Uh, 1,250 meals were delivered to the Debakey VA Hospital. Here's a picture of, of that. That's the Debakey uh, Veterans Administration Hospital, and they've been so hard hit. It's been really tough down there, and um, we've sent 1,250 meals to them today, and we did it again. We did it a couple days ago, so that means 2,500 meals to the healthcare workers there, and one of the nurses died from COVID-19 there at the Bakey Veterans Administration Hospital. And so what an honor to serve them. 70 meals and 80 hygiene packs were delivered to the homeless in Conroe this week. 340 Easter packs were delivered to senior adults. Um, we've been in touch with Pastor Oscar, our full-time pastor in the Quarry Slum in Nairobi, Kenya at um, Woodlands Church ICC, Kenya, and they've had 8,932 people watch their services on their Facebook page, and they've contacted half of those. They said more than half of those we've contacted and been in touch with. Um, we've been also doing benevolence for people in our church who are out of work, who can't pay bills. We've had amazing stories of, of a church people making such an impact and such a difference. Uh, 
and we just praise God for what's going on, Woodland Church, and that's just this week. There's so many more things I can't even mention, but it is time for the church to rise up when everything else shuts down. Crisis time is Christ time, without a doubt. But then the last thing is the anchor of unshakable commitment. The anchor of unshakable commitment. It says in 1 Corinthians 3.11, for God has already placed Jesus Christ as the one and only foundation, and no other foundation can be laid. He's the only one we can trust in, Jesus Christ. He's the only one we can rest in. Hey, did you know that tonight, um, when the sun went down, it started Passover, Jewish Passover. And of course, that's celebrated because of what God did back in the Old Testament when he spared the children of Israel and their firstborn, and the death angel passed over. And what happened, remember? He told Moses that what you need to do is take a perfect, unblemished lamb, sacrifice it. Everyone sacrificed their best lamb and take the blood and, and smear it across the door frame so that the death angel will pass by. And it was only the enemy who experienced the, the pain and the death. And, and all of the people of God, though, they put that, that blood of the lamb over and the, and the death angel passed over. And that's where Passover, of course, comes from. And of course, it's this powerful symbolism of the perfect lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who would be coming. And his perfect sinless blood covers us so that we don't have to be afraid, so that we don't have to worry, so that we get heaven one day. We get God's strength here in the present. We get God's protection and guidance. And so I just really challenge you in your home right now, I just hope that you will just say a, a little prayer of just saying, God, thank you that your blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, your son, covers our household, and you're watching over us, and you're protecting us. You say, well, Carrie, what about all the Christians who have died in the COVID-19? Yes, there have been some of the greatest Christians in the world today, especially in China, who have, who have died in this. And what I'm saying is, I do believe God protects. I do believe God heals through his son, Jesus Christ, and by his wounds we are healed. But the ultimate healing is heaven. That's the ultimate healing, and we can count on it because of Jesus Christ, because of his blood. You can cover your household in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ. He's the only one that we can put our faith in. He's the only one we can put our trust in. He's the only one who will never change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And praise God, it's because of his mercy and his grace. And he shed his blood on that good Friday on the cross that we have salvation only because of him, only because of what he's done. And right now, if you've never received Christ, I hope that you'll do that right now. You can just click that you're raising your hand to receive Christ and pray this prayer with me because it really all comes down to the fact that he's the only one that we can count on. He's the only one that we can place our total faith and trust in. He's the only one we can place our eternity and our hopes for eternity in. And so do that right now. Just pray a prayer like this. You can pray it silently to God. Just say, dear Jesus Christ, as best I know how, I put my hope in you alone. Forgive me for trusting in so many things that have never satisfied or fill the emptiness in my soul. I need your forgiveness, I need your grace. I need you in my life desperately. Come into my life through your Holy Spirit and save me, forgive me of all my sins and thank you that you give me heaven as a free gift. I receive it and receive you into my life. Thank you that you shed your blood so that I would be totally forgiven. Thank you for making me a Christian. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna have some question and answers uh, in just one moment, but right now, <clears throat> I want us to go to a song because I want you to prepare your heart. Communion's only for Christ followers, okay? And so, if Christ is in your life, maybe you just received Christ or maybe you've received him 30 years ago, communion is for Christ followers. And we celebrate communion to remember what Christ did on the cross. Now, here's the important thing. That juice symbolizes Christ's blood, his perfect blood that was poured out for us, that covers us. And then the, the cracker, the bread symbolizes his body given for us. 
And there's something powerful that takes place when we focus in on his death for us. But it says in scripture, first and foremost, we're to make sure we're right with God. And so I encourage you during this song, and just ask the Holy Spirit silently, is there any areas of my life that aren't what they ought to be? Are there things I'm trusting in that aren't what they should be? Are there things, sins in my life that I need to confess? And just say, Lord, I confess them. Just admit them to God and he forgives and you're cleansed and, and you can be back in communion with him. So you see, when you come to Christ, he'll never leave you or forsake you, but you can push him out of the center of your life. And maybe you've kind of pushed him to the side and you've been trusting in other things. This is the time to just say, God, I, I need your forgiveness and grace. I, I need you. I want to put you back at the center of my life. I want to live for the things that are most important. I need you to be at the center of my life. Let this be a time where you get reconnected to God and make sure that you're right with God before you take communion because it's only in Christ alone that we can trust. And you can sing this with us as well. In Christ alone my hope is found he is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still and when strife. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, the fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love. Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live Light of the world by darkness slain, but then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine. With the precious blood of Christ No guilt in life, no fear in death This is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry to its final breath Jesus commands my destiny And no power of hell And no scheme of man Could ever pluck me from his hand Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. 
Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. I praise God for his forgiveness and for his grace. And I, I just right now want us to bow before we take communion and just thank the Lord for his grace. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your forgiveness in our lives. Lord, I come before you and just say to you, I recommit to you right now. Lord, I want to focus on the things that really matter. I don't want to waste any time. I don't want to waste any of my life, Lord. I want to follow you. And I just pray that you would forgive me and forgive all of us, Lord, of all the things that keep us from following you, of all the things that we allow in our lives that keep us from following you, where we don't just trust you totally. And so, Lord, we thank you for your free gift of forgiveness and grace that your perfect sinless blood is covered. We don't deserve it. We couldn't earn it, but we accept it, and we thank you. We thank you for what you did on that Good Friday. In Jesus' name, amen. And now the scripture tells us that Jesus took the bread, he broke it, he blessed it. And sometimes it takes us experiencing brokenness before we can be blessed by him. And maybe you feel broken today. You're in a good place because God wants to bring blessing in your life. If you just turn to him, the bread of life. And it says that he took the bread, he broke it, he blessed it, he passed it out. And then he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. And then he took the cup and the scripture says that he took the cup and he says it represents the new covenant, my blood spilled for you for forgiveness and cleansing. Take and drink. Well, I want us to do some question and answer and then we'll have our song and, and offering as we'll head out. But Ryan is here. Ryan, you've got some questions that people have been sending in. Um, I'll try to answer them best I can. Yeah, we've gotten some great questions. Well, here's some of the questions that have come in. There's been some, been some really good ones, Dad. Uh, here's the first one that came through. This is from The Rising. He asked this question. In the history of the world, what has followed the periods after God shook, no pun intended, <laughs> the world? What, what have you yeah. seen You know, in, in, in your studies? What have you seen from what's happened in the world after periods of big shocks? Well, I need, I need to study that a lot more, that's for sure. But one thing that I, I do know is that after a shaking takes place, uh, there's a real revival that happens. People come to the Lord. And, and so what I believe is going to be happening, uh, I don't, I'm no prophet, I don't know, you know what's next, but I do believe that um, there will be two tracks going forward where there'll be some things that will get worse, some evil, there'll be more and more evil in the world. The scripture tells us that, you know, as we move closer and closer to Christ's return. But there'll be more salvation than ever. There'll be more miracles than ever. There'll be more of God working in our lives than ever. There'll be more great things and good things that are happening in our lives as well. And so it's kind of two tracks. And I find that life kind of runs in those two tracks. You know, we, uh, Chris and I used to always think that life was kind of like a roller coaster. That either you're, everything's going good or everything's kind of going bad or it's kind of medium. But really, there, there are great things happening in our lives. At the same time, there are really painful things happening in all of our lives. It's kind of two tracks. And, so, and sometimes they intertwine. And, and I, I believe that. So, and I think God wants us to focus on this revival, this return to Christ in our own hearts. And we ought to just reach out to everyone we can to get them in the lifeboat to get them in the real lifeboat um, before Christ returns. That's awesome. That's a good word. Thank you, Dad. This next question comes from Isabella. Uh, Isabella, you're doing amazing. We're so glad you're with us. Here's what she asked. She says, how can I make my teenage friends believe in God at this time? A lot of times their parents won't even let them hear about God, and I just feel like it's hard to get through to them. Yeah, I think the main thing, Isabella, is just uh, being an example in their life, just loving them, you know, and seeking to meet needs in Christ's love, and then uh, pray for them. That's a huge thing. Always pray for them, because what happens a lot of times is people don't realize how much they need God until everything they're trusting in is shaken, and I know for some people right now, they don't feel real, that they're going through real shaking right now. Maybe they feel invincible. It's just not true, but, but sometimes Satan fools people, and so 
it's important for you to make sure you're always there and ready because there'll be a time, there'll come a time when they realize they're fragile, everything's fragile, everything they're trusting in. It may not be tomorrow, it may not be next year, but there'll come a time. And I've seen it so many times. You know, we've had so many people that Randy and I went to high school with that have come to Christ over the last, you know, 10 years at Woodland Church because everybody comes, goes through a time where it's just like, Nothing you're trusting in is working, and you need Jesus. And praise God that he's good enough to let us fall flat on our face so that we can get to our knees and find him. That's awesome. Thanks, Dad. And these questions are so good. Thank you guys for the questions. Keep sending them. Here's another one that we got from Chris. He says, my family continues to fight with each other, and it's just hard being under quarantine for so long. Do you have any advice for me to get through to my kids who are all different ages and really connect with my wife and spouse when we're all kind of at each other's throats? Yes, that is tough because that's the way we all are right now. And there's no doubt about it. I mean, you throw, you know, families together and there's going to be a lot of great things and there's going to be a lot of stress. And just remember, though, that, that that stress sometimes can be really good, that God brings things out of you that, and reveals that they're there, some of the anger and frustrations. And it's real important just to talk about it. You may have just a family conference where you get together and you talk about stresses and frustrations, and maybe read a scripture together, say a prayer. Maybe you've never prayed much before. Maybe you've uh, prayed with your family every day. But I think it's a really good time to do that and just um, maybe have a time where, you know, you shut everything off for 10 minutes and everybody turns their cell phone in for 10 minutes and you just read a scripture and you just talk about how everybody's feeling and you pray together. And you could just be honest about, hey, we've been really at each other's throats right now. And so Chris and I are going to keep talking about this. And uh, after Easter, we got some really neat things planned on marriage and family that we're going to be doing online to really help you practically. How do you stop uh, attacking each other and taking it out on each other, but you take it to God and you talk it out? So it's a great question. That's awesome. Thanks, Dad. Maybe, maybe one more. They asked, do you have any predictions on when live sports will start up again? No, I'm just joking. That was me. <laughs> I think everyone's asking that. No. Yeah, um, I, I don't have any predictions when live sports are going to pick up again, but we all miss them. That's for sure. <laughs> here's, this, here's a question from SS. It's a practical one. He says, what are some practical ways I can stop fear from rising during the day? Well, that is a great question because fear is this emotion that uh, is going to fill you up, whether you want it to or not, but then you've got a choice what you do with it. You know, fear will just hit, and I think a big thing is don't watch uh, too much news feeds, you know, try to limit that. I mean, sure, check in. It's important what's going on and and be wise, but um, I think sometimes we just fill our minds with all kinds of negativity, and it really derails us, and then when you start feeling the fear come on, just Get on your knees and say, God, I'm scared. Be honest with God. I'm scared. I've had to do that many times during this. And I need you to fill me up with your peace that passes understanding. You're the prince of peace. Thank you that you're in control, whether I feel it or not. Thank you that you're the king of the crisis. You're going to see us through. Thank you. And then maybe try to breathe, you know, just slow breaths and just meditate on scripture and breathe in and out just slowly. That's a technique that's very helpful as you're meditating on Scripture and thinking about Scripture. Um, but I, I think that uh, the worst thing to do is probably just distract yourself. And we do that a lot. We distract ourselves, and then it comes back when you lay your head on the pillow at night. Just keep turning to Jesus. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. We need one more. This okay. one came, came from uh, Jennifer, and she says, um, is God using this pandemic to possibly shake our attention and, and really uh, get our attention as a society right now? I think without a doubt, you know, that God is allowing it. I, I'm not saying God's causing it. I, I don't understand it all, that's for sure. And it just, uh, we'll never understand it all till we get to heaven because there's been some amazing godly people that have lost their lives and um, going into the front lines to serve others. And we'll never understand that totally till we get to heaven. But I know God's allowing this to shake us so that we can find out what is unshakable that relationship with Christ and heaven one day and lifting up Jesus Christ. And so, yeah, without a doubt, and I think a big part of it for the church is to wake us up, to wake up Christ followers so that we totally trust in him during these times. So we learn to really trust him and we learn to to really care about others and really reach out and make a difference. So reach out and invite someone to Easter. 
maybe text a friend or go back and find someone you went to high school with that, um, uh, that you know that doesn't know the Lord and just check on them, you know, just check on them, see how they're doing and invite them to Easter because we have people from all over the world that tune in for our services now. So one of the most loving things you ever do is invite someone to the Easter service because you know they're going to hear Jesus in a real creative, credible, and clear way. Well, God bless you, Woodlands Church. We love you. Don't forget, our first Easter service starts Friday night, Good Friday, 6 and 7.30. God bless you. We love you.